Hey there, TikTokers. The scariest night of the year has arrived. We couldn't miss this important event for Halloween lovers and bring you a new Halloween night special. Careful, we alert all those with heart problems that they may suffer several scares today. You've been warned. Will you start this video with a creepy pasta? Which of you knows Sally Williams? We hope you all know who we are talking about, because we start with the story of her cousin. Didn't you know that Sally had a cousin? Turn off the lights, adjust the volume of your speakers or headphones, and let the night of terror begin. On the eve of the first day of school, Sam looked at the schedule and organized his school supplies. Notebooks, pens, books. He always tried his best in school. He felt the need to make it up to his parents, who had welcomed him with love despite not sharing any blood ties. Although they weren't his biological parents, the affection Sam received from them was deep and sincere. Happiness filled his heart as he remembered how lucky he was to have a family. He hadn't always lived in that home. He remembered the days at the orphanage, where he had been with other children in similar situations. Over time, his friends from the orphanage were adopted one after another, leaving him alone and wondering if anyone would want him as a son. Despite his doubts, the orphanage director comforted him, promising that someone special would come into his life. Years passed and Sam had grown up. He was now 13. As he was getting ready for the first day of school, he heard a knock on his door. When he opened it, he found his adoptive mother, a beautiful woman with light brown hair and bright green eyes. She had come to wish him good night and make sure he was ready for the new school course. Some thanked her for her concern and assured her that he already had everything. His mother sat next to him, hugged him, and reminded him that both she and his father would always be there for him. The night was quiet. The young man knew that every night hid mysteries in the shadows. He had the ability to see things that others couldn't, an ability he considered a curse. So he hid it from his parents so as not to worry them. His greatest wish was to make the Williams family happy, because they had given him everything he had ever wanted. Thus, while the moon shed its light and the wind lightly shook the trees, Sam sunk into a dream ready to face a new day full of emotions at school. The first day of school passed without a hitch, and Sam was walking back home in the company of his two new friends. He stared at their blonde hair and how much they looked alike, so he couldn't help but ask them if they were brothers. They both nodded and responded in unison, causing the young man to laugh. They asked him if he had one too, and he said no although he would have loved to have a little sister. His friends, on the other hand, expressed their envy for being an only child and told him all the inconveniences of having to put up with a brother at home. Some laughed at all their anecdotes. They got annoyed and made fun of each other, but deep down, he could sense their affection. As they talked and walked by the park, Sam had a fleeting vision. <laughs> He saw a strange-looking girl appear and disappear into the trees. This stumped him and he stopped immediately. His new friends, worried, asked him what was happening. He explained to them what he had seen, but the brothers looked at him skeptically, assuring him that there was no one there. Three months passed since the first appearance and the visions became more and more frequent. Throughout his life, he had experienced countless encounters with the inexplicable, like people only he seemed to see. However, what intrigued him was one figure in particular, the same one he had seen two years ago inside the car of those who would later become his adoptive parents. The persistence of these apparitions had him perplexed, and what began as a coincidence became a repetition. Despite everything, Sam chose not to share these experiences with his parents, hoping that everything would return to normal. One night, he was lying in bed, reflecting on the mysterious girl who seemed to follow him. He wondered why she did it, a question that seemed to have no answer. At that moment, a noise brought him out of his thoughts. He went down the stairs and towards the living room, where he thought the sound was coming from. 
His gaze fell on a photo frame on the floor, which was previously on top of a piece of furniture. He bent down to pick up the frame and noticed that the glass was broken in a strange way. But even stranger, the family photo seemed to have been damaged, although only where the figures of his parents and him were. The mountainous landscape in the background remained intact. Sam looked out the window and finally saw those beautiful but disturbing green eyes that belonged to that unknown specter. A silent change of glances allowed them to communicate without words. As he stood there, everything seemed to grow darker, blurrier. Watching as the female silhouette disappeared into the darkness of his own vision. With the light of a new day, Sam woke up with a memory of what happened the night before. Although he found it difficult to believe, it was clear that he had come into contact with the person responsible for turning his life into a nightmare. She pursued him tirelessly and seemed to know his home. The shattered image of his family in the frame was a sign that something was threatening them. He knew there must be a reason behind all that. The memory of when he was only eight years old came to his mind. They used to ask him why he didn't play with other children. His response was always the same. I can't play with them, they think I'm strange. The director of the orphanage had noticed his isolation and had tried to comfort him, but he had always felt different. One day, Sam finally shared his secret with the director. He explained that he saw the dead and that he was the only one who could see them. The director was surprised by that confession, but instead of rejecting him, he showed concern and understanding. He invited him to his office to discuss the matter further, surprising Sam, who didn't expect to find so much interest and support from an adult. Sam followed the director down the hallway, looking at the paintings that adorned the walls, depicting fantastical landscapes that seemed straight out of fairy tales. However, his tranquility was interrupted when a shadow passed over the walls of the narrow office before the director closed the door and roughly shoved him into a chair. Something was terribly wrong. The director's eyes, which he had trusted all his life, no longer conveyed calm, but chaos. Sam felt panic, his heart was beating furiously and tears began to blur his eyes. The director spoke in a strange tone and Sam wished he hadn't seen the sign sooner. But that was already part of the past. He had to find a way to explain what happened the night before to his parents, who would surely have seen the broken painting. To his surprise, when he went to look at it, the frame and photograph were intact, which baffled him even more. The expression of disbelief on his face attracted the attention of Mrs. Williams, who approached her son worriedly and asked if everything was okay. Sam tried to find the right words to explain what had happened, but his mother interrupted him, assuming his lack of sleep was due to watching TV late. She warned him about the nightmares he might have if he stayed up late into the night and continued with his household chores. The young man felt confused. Had it all been a nightmare? Hadn't his parents found him laying on the living room floor? Nothing made sense. The day passed without a hitch, and the dreaded night came again. Everyone was in their rooms, when suddenly, Sam heard footsteps approaching and knocks on the glass of his window. He tried to ignore it, but then he felt cold arms hugging him from behind. The pale arms looked feminine and showed deep cuts. Cold lips touched his ear and uttered an incomprehensible word. Sam was terrified, unable to scream. Hours passed like this, and although that dead ghost hugged him, he managed to calm down a little. Finally, he dared to speak and told her that she had to leave. The entity began to fade as Sam ran to his parents' room to make sure they were okay. Seeing them sleeping, he felt relief, but the noise of the door woke up Mr. and Mrs. Williams with a start. His father, Frank, mistook him for an intruder and became scared. After seeing that it was his son, worried, he asked him what had happened. The young man explained that a dead girl had hugged him, but his parents were perplexed and assured him that he had had a nightmare. They insisted that he go back to bed, and the young man went to bed again discouraged and upset because no one believed him. 
He noticed his back was wet, so he took off his pajamas and saw that there were blood stains. That made him think about the state of the ghost girl who had hugged him. He wondered what the true intentions of that spirit were. Love or hate? Confusion invaded him. The hug had shown affection, but the breaking of the photo in the frame, anger. For days, Sam tried to get back into his usual routine, but he couldn't stop thinking about the ghost girl. His curiosity led him to search for information in his parents' boxes of documents, where he found a photo that shocked him. On the back of the photo was a date. While examining old newspaper articles, he discovered the tragic story of a girl named Sally Williams, who had been found dead in a park on the same date mentioned in the photograph. Sam realized that Sally was his parents' biological daughter and also the ghost girl who was haunting him. Finally, the young man confronted his parents and demanded the truth. After that came a mixture of relief and terror. Remembering the story, his parents felt once again the pain they had felt that day. With that disappointment in tow, the young man locked himself in his bedroom and the night passed slowly. In the midst of his thoughts, he noticed that the door was open, even though he had closed it before going to bed. In the blink of an eye, the ghost girl, Sally, appeared there. <coughs> she was covered in blood and looked injured. His words made Sam tremble in fear. Mom and Dad are sleeping now. He ran out of the room and headed to his parents' room, but what he found left him breathless. That was a dantesque show. Remains of human flesh and blood were scattered throughout the bedroom, with all the walls stained with horror. Fear made him flee. He ran as fast as he could in search of help, finally reaching the park. A piercing scream shook the night. Don't leave me alone! He ran while wiping the tears that were wet from his cheeks. Don't leave me alone again! It was three in the morning when a cold breeze enveloped him and Sam felt Sally's presence behind him. In an instant, she revealed shocking information to him. Her uncle Johnny, who was also her father, had killed her. Sam was stunned and confused by this revelation, while Sally continued with a terrible story. She told him that Karen, his biological mother, and Sally Sand had had many fights with his father and they ended up divorcing. The separation had upset the mother, who reacted by hurting Sam when he was just a baby. The neighbors heard Sam's screams and crying several times, so after complaints she was hospitalized and he was left at an orphanage. There, Sam had an accident when he fell from a tree and was in a coma for several months. Sometime later, the boy woke up but only remembered the people from the orphanage. Later, a couple wanted to adopt him. They were Sally's parents, his real uncles. Sally accused her parents of wanting to forget her and replace her. The young man, with his eyes full of tears and his voice full of anger, shouted at Sally accusing her of having murdered his family and trying to deceive him with a story. Then Sally approached him with supernatural speed and her mind possessed the young man's, making him relieve the moments of her death. Suddenly, the same wounds of the young woman began to appear in Sam's body. When they separated, Sam felt dazed but not afraid. His eyes were lost. He watched Sally walk away through the trees. Sam followed her, driven by curiosity and not experiencing the dread he had felt before. It was a time when entities usually roamed the streets, but this time there was no one but the moon, Sam, and Sally's laughter as she hid, waiting for him to agree to join her game. At that moment, Sam remembered seeing a child laying motionless on the grass. His perceptions had become incredibly real, and all the voices from the dark world that he thought were only in his mind were now part of his reality. He felt a need to resolve his doubts, so he approached the body on the ground, which was still bleeding from the deep wounds. The wounds on the boy's body reflected a tragedy, a story similar to his own. Sam began to wonder if that boy on the ground could be himself. What do you think of this story? Creepy, right? As you may not all remember Sally's story well, 
We watch it again together to better understand this young woman's creepy pasta. Don't leave, because after this video, we have many surprises. Sally was 8 years old and was a polite, cheerful and very obedient girl. Like any other day, she was playing in the street with her friends when her mother, Mary, called her to eat. During lunch, she told her that her uncle was coming to visit, something that made the little girl very happy. A few days later, Uncle Joni arrived at the family home, awakening everyone's joy. After greeting Sally's parents, they caught up with the news. Johnny had parted ways with Karen, his wife, but he seemed happy with that. They had a family dinner and everyone raved about the delicious dishes Sally's mother prepared. But the little girl was very sleepy and had been rubbing her eyes for a while. It was time to go to bed. Her uncle offered to walk her to her bedroom. He carried her in his arms and together they entered the room. Johnny closed the door behind him and looked at the terrible disorder that reigned in the room. That amused him. Together, they looked for the pajamas that the little girl would wear, even he joked about finding some with strawberries. In the end, they chose one with the unicorns. They both loved them. Her uncle began to undress her, but the girl told him that she could do it herself. However, he continued with the work. He put her pajamas on and soon after, Sally's mother came in to see if they could manage on their own. She kissed her daughter and Uncle Joni told her he would stay with her for a while longer. She smiled and left him alone. But Uncle Joni had a strange face. He was going to do something very bad. As the days passed, Mary noticed that the girl was very strange. Her character had completely changed. She was sad. Therefore, she approached to talk to her and asked if everything was alright. Without saying anything, the girl began to cry inconsolably. When she could, she stammered. Mom, I didn't want to play his game. After telling her what happened, her mother told her that it had just been a nightmare and that she had to forget about it. She held her tight to comfort her. She later told her husband that her daughter was having horrible nightmares. While they were talking, Johnny interrupted them to let them know that he was going to the store and that he could take Sally. The mother agreed and Sally reluctantly got into his car. But when they passed the supermarket, her uncle just kept going. He did not stop his car. He was smiling at the wheel and the girl was behind, totally terrified. Finally, her uncle parked the car in an old disused park. When he stopped the engine, he turned and, addressing the girl, he said, You have broken the rules of the game. You said you would play, and you did not do well. Then he got out of the car and also took the girl out. You have to be punished for breaking the rules. That same day, a couple found the girl's body in the park. She was dead. A few days later, a teenager heard strange noises as he was about to go to bed. He thought he had closed the door tightly, but still got up to look. As he approached it, he heard a moan, like a woman's crying. And then he saw a hunched girl, covered in blood and crying. Who are you? He asked. The girl stopped crying and more blood began to flow from her body. Then she said, This is my home. Sally had snuck into her old home where she'd been happy with her parents so many times. With a serious face, she turned to the boy and said, Do you want to play? Play with me. We are back. As we know that you love to know information about us, we will tell you some curiosities. Many of you already know that we live in Galicia, an autonomous community in the north of Spain. Our region is known for being Terra de Megas, that is, land of witches. Our community is full of traditions, stories, and legends in which magic and horror stories are very present. That's why we love this genre. There is a saying that goes, I don't believe in witches, but Abelas Ailas, which means we don't believe in witches, but they are out there. Stay to learn more information about them. The first signs of witchcraft appeared in classical civilizations and almost always practiced by women. 
They would gather at night and had the power of transforming into flying animals as well as producing diseases and storms. The most famous witches in classical Greece were Medea and Circe, who were especially skilled in making magic potions. They used to be associated with particular places, such as swamps and graveyards, which were considered portals to the underworld. Some witches would take advantage of their connection with the dead to predict the future, such as Erecto in ancient Rome. There was also the witch of Ender, who, according to the Bible, turned to King Saul to speak with the dead prophet Samuel. Witches would gather at covens for Sabbaths. Parties celebrated at midnight where they would drink and dance in honor of the horned god of fertility and nature. To carry them out, they would choose remote places where they could practice magical rituals that would grant them even more powers. Those gatherings also served to convert new adepts, boys and girls who were kidnapped from their own homes and consecrated to that god. They would start as disciples of the other witches, serving them until becoming witches themselves. Meanwhile, other children would suffer a much worse fate, becoming food in cannibal banquets or becoming ingredients for potions and magical ointments. To reach those remote covens, the witches would travel at extremely high speeds as if they were blasts of wind, riding either a beast or a magical broom. Some witches even had the power of teleporting, as well as the power of transforming into their favorite animal, a crow, frog, rat, hare or cat. Now, witches didn't exist just in North America, but also in Latin America. Legends talk about witches that could transform into birds, more specifically, a mythical bird known as a chonchon, which looked like a human head with wings and claws. Other witches would wear a macoon vest, a vest made with the chest skin of a dead maiden, which would grant them the ability to fly. However, the horrifying practices of the witches were as terrible as the brutal persecutions they suffered during the Middle Ages. It all started in the 13th century, when the church started to associate them to the cult of the devil and created inquisition courts to persecute them and punish them. Many accusations were made just for political reasons or just out of envy. Many times, it was simply healers using natural remedies and many innocents were persecuted. To identify the witches and make them confess, the suspects would be subject to different kinds of torture. They would be interrogated for hours, they would be confounded with false promises of salvation and they would also be stuffed with needles to see if they bled or showed pain. There was also the belief that true witches could float on water, so the suspects would have their feet and hands tied and would then be thrown to a lake. If they raised to the surface, the accusation would be demonstrated. However, if the suspect instead drowned at the bottom of the lake, then her innocent soul would be saved. And the ones declared as guilty of being witches would be sentenced to be burned alive at the stake. The bloodiest time for witches started in the 15th century, when it was allowed for the civilian court to carry out those trials. In all of Europe, it is calculated that between 50,000 and 100,000 people were sentenced to death during those trials, about 80% of them being women. The last victims date from the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, when numerous protests finally stopped those cruel trials. Many witches went down in history with their proper names. Alice Keteler, the first one with proper historical records, dates back from the 14th century. She was a beautiful Irish woman, capable of manipulating men so they would fulfill all of her whims. We also have Mother Shipton, a powerful clairvoyant from the 16th century who had the stereotypical appearance we normally associate with witches. Hunched body, bulging eyes and a long hooked nose. In 1621, Elizabeth Sawyer was accused of bewitching the children and livestock of her neighbors because they refused to buy her brooms. She ended up confessing to being a witch and having touched a devil who would come to her in the form of a dog. She was executed. In 1785, Ellie Kedward was accused of deceiving many children in the town in order to steal their blood. 
Centuries later, her story would inspire the 1999 movie The Blair Witch Project. Nowadays, our understanding about witchcraft and pagan rituals has changed drastically. In fact, there are now publicly recognized religions such as Wicca, which is based in the practices of ancient witches, as well as the tenets of other ancient religions. To become part of the Wicca religion, it's necessary to undergo formal education and training, go through different grades and be initiated by an established Wicca member or priest. However, in other places of the world, such as certain regions in Africa, witchcraft is still being practiced in the most horrifying ways possible, with rituals that involve mutilation or even the sacrifice of innocent victims, according to the UN's Children Protection Agency. So, now you know, TikTokers. Be careful about what you do this Halloween. Leave the spells and potions to the professionals if you don't want to become the target of an angry evil witch. Or don't worry, since witches don't actually exist. <laughs> right? Halloween is the second most successful celebration in the United States, only behind Christmas. It is estimated that over $6 billion is spent, including candy, decorations, costumes. And we're not surprised. People love horror. Let's continue the evening with another shocking story. In all my years as a police inspector in this little town, I have never seen a case like this. I don't believe in the existence of any creatures or anything supernatural, but I do admit that what happened made me doubt myself. It all started that day that foreigner arrived in town. He was a solitary man who bought an abandoned house in the outskirts and settled there. Soon, people started talking and everybody was interested in knowing the identity of this strange man who didn't talk to anyone, never went in town and would go out alone every morning to hunt out in the countryside. Being myself the person in charge of keeping order, I felt obliged to find out more about him, and I planned a casual encounter, pretending to be another hunter. He was an Englishman with a weird accent, called Sir John Rowell. His appearance stood out. He was very tall and broad, his hair and beard red. I gained his trust, and one day he invited me to have a beer at his place. He welcomed me with courtesy, and I took advantage of the situation and asked him about himself and his life. He told me that he had spent his life traveling around exotic regions in Africa, America and the Indies, practicing his favorite hobby, hunting. The walls in his house were full of wild and grotesque trophies of animals he had hunted, and he talked about them with passion. I showed myself interested, as I was intrigued by his personality and his stories. But suddenly, I saw something on the shelf over the fireplace that sent a chill down my spine. It was the hand of a man, not the clean white hand of a skeleton, no, a dried black hand with yellow nails, the muscles exposed and traces of old blood on the bones, which were cut off clean. The Englishman talked about it with pride. He said it was from his best enemy and explained how he himself had cut it off with a saber and dried it out in the sun for eight days. I got close to examine it, and despite the damage, you could tell it had belonged to a real giant. But the most strange thing was how around the wrist there was this huge iron chain holding it tight to the wall with a big ring. I tried to hide my disgust, making a comment about how strong that mud might have been. And he said that was the reason why it was chained to the wall, so it couldn't escape. I didn't know if he was joking or if he was actually crazy, so I changed the subject and we talked about his collection of weapons. Something that called my attention was seeing several handguns on the furniture, loaded and ready to be used, as if he was ready for a surprise attack. That visit troubled me a lot, so I watched him for a while, closely, but he kept on with his routine, with no farther incidents. I put the whole thing aside in my mind, until some time later his servant came to me, frightened, asking for help. His master had been acting weird for a month. He would go to bed very late at night, locking himself up carefully. He always had guns close at hand, and usually at night he would talk out loud, as if he was arguing with somebody. 
I decided to go near his house one of those nights, and what I saw through the window was a grotesque scene. The man, controlled by rage, was hidden with a whip with right hand tied to the wall. The following morning, I got the terrible news. Sir John Rowell had been found dead at his place. No door or window had been forced, and nothing had been stolen. When I went to investigate what had happened, I found that it had been a martyr. The body had signs of a terrible fight and the clothes were torn. The neck showed signs of choking, his face showed terrible terror and he was holding something between his teeth. After examining the body, the medical examiner was shocked. It had five marks with the shape of a sharp end in the neck, as if he had been strangled by a skeleton. A chill went down my body and I looked at the shelf over the fireplace. The chain was broken and the hand had disappeared. The medical examiner took one of its fingers out of the victim's mouth. A meticulous investigation took place, but nothing came out of it. For several nights, I had terrible nightmares. I saw the hand running around my room like a scorpion or a spider, moving its fingers as if they were legs. It crawled up to my bed and it watched me, threatening me. One of those nights, I woke up and found a window in my room open. When I looked out, I saw a human figure running away in the fog, and though scared, I decided to follow the figure. Its trace took me to the cemetery, specifically to the grave of Sir John Rowell. There, on his grave, lied the hand that had been tormenting me for days. It was lacking its index finger, motionless, but still grotesque and threatening. I looked in the distance and I saw the shape of a man running away. In the faint light of the moon, I couldn't tell whether he was missing a hand or not. If we talk about countries where they have an incredible wealth of horror legends, we cannot fail to mention Mexico. We love knowing the stories of your towns, the ones that your relatives tell you from generation to generation. Below, we'll leave you one of the ones we liked the most. Let's see if you can guess which one it is. We were by the river. The fire was burning and the flames were shaking. The bells rang, letting us know it was 11 o'clock at night. Suddenly, it all went dead silent. Nobody laughed, nobody talked. We could only hear the rustling of a cold wind. Then, a woman came from the woods. We heard a painful and muffled cry. Oh, my children. Do you know who we're talking about? We are talking about La Llorona, the weeping woman. A woman with a ghost-like appearance, dressed in white with long dark hair, who floats in the air with a soft veil covering her horrifying face. She comes from the west and goes towards the north, wandering and crying around the streets. La Llorona is a ghost in the Latin American folklore. According to oral tradition, she is the lost soul of a woman who lost her kids and wanders around trying to find them, and is scaring anyone who sees her or hears her with her horrible cry. A sad story, a horror story of lovesickness and treason that has been passed on from generation to generation. This legend has many different versions depending on the region you are in, but they all agree on something. She always shows up near the water and her cries are deafening. One of the most popular versions tells the story of a beautiful young woman of humble origins. She was the lover of a nobleman. For a time, they were very happy and had three kids together. But one day, he left her without explanations of any type. Soon after, she found out he was marrying somebody else. This destroyed the heart of this beautiful woman. Heartbroken, she decided to take revenge on him in the cruelest way she could think of. One night, she woke the kids up and took them for a walk near the river, close to their house. Blind by anger, a terrible rage possessed her and she could feel all the love she felt for them turn into hate. She drowned them until they were all dead. She suddenly reacted and when she realized what she had just done, she started running desperately into the river until her body was completely covered with water. She made that terrible cry and disappeared. From that moment on, La Llorona became a wandering soul. She walks around the streets looking for her lost kids, crying and yelling, hence her name. People say La Llorona attracts kids who misbehave, so she can take them to the river as an offering to be forgiven. She seduces adults with her beauty to take revenge on the one man that betrayed her. 
But when they try to take her veil off, they discover her white gaunt face and her eyes trying to dig in the deepest parts of the soul to trap them in her cries. There are many people that say they have seen or heard her cries. Her story still scares little boys and girls, but also adults. The origins of La Llorona are not very clear. Ancient cultures believed in ghosts that appear next to rivers. Some historians think that in Mexico, the origin of La Llorona can be related to the Tihuacoati, goddess of the Mexicas, half woman and half snake. According to the legend, she comes from the water of the Lake Texcoco to cry for her children. And even though in Mexico La Llorona is one of the most important figures in popular culture, there are many other cultures with a similar legend. In Chile, she is known as La Pucuyen, a soul in purgatory believed to cry eternally because her kids were taken from her arms when they were very little. This ghost can only be seen by people when they are really close to dying, as well as people with special abilities. In Colombia, they talk about the Tarumama, the wandering ghost that walks around the valleys and mountains, close to rivers and lakes, dressed with a black robe that covers all her body down to her heels. Her face is a terrifying skull, and in her eye sockets she has two incandescent balls. She carries the dead body of a baby and she cries tears of blood. These are only some examples. In other countries such as Venezuela, Uruguay, Argentina, Panama, El Salvador, Honduras, España or Costa Rica, they also have the legend that tells the story of the ghostly presence of this wandering young woman. Tic-tackers, do you also have the story of the Llorona in your country? What other popular legends would you like us to talk about? Leave a comment and let us know! What would Halloween be without the famous internet creepypastas? Day after day, you ask us for your favorites. Some we already have on the channel, but we still have many to show. Do you remember the one about Smile Dog? Let's watch it again together. The first time I met Mary in person was in the summer of 2007. Her husband Terence set the date up. In the beginning, Mary agreed I was just an experienced writer searching for ideas for a novel. When I got to their house, I couldn't see Mary. She had locked herself up in her room. Terence and I stood in front of the room's door. She talked and I took notes. Even though I couldn't see her, I knew she was crying. <laughs> Mary talked without making any sense about her horrible nightmares. I decided to leave. I didn't want to bother her. Her story was very tough. In 1992, she was working as a software developer for an important company. That was the year she found the image Smile.jpg and her life changed forever. Mary was one of the 400 people that saw the picture, but she was the only one who talked openly about the experience. After the event, she could barely leave her house and she had to quit her job. It was in 2005 that I found out about the existence of this picture through internet forums that talked about paranormal cases. Lots of people knew Smile.dog existed, the creature that supposedly appeared in the Smile.jpg picture. Mary was the most mentioned victim in all conversations. The other people affected have remained anonymous. Or maybe they disappeared. Actually, there was no credible information. All the phenomenon was focused on a picture that can't be found anywhere. Though there were many imitations and fake copies around in forums and through chain emails. Witnesses stated that once you see it, you suffer immediately a sudden epilepsy attack and a severe anxiety. All the supposed victims gave the same description of the picture, a creature that looked like a husky in a dark room lit only by the flash of the camera. The only detail they could see clearly in the background is a human hand. The hand isn't holding anything, but it seems alive. The dog has shiny eyes and a big, gloomy smile, showing two rows of teeth, very white, very straight, very perfect. When you see it, you suffer an epileptic attack and you never forget it. The dog comes to the dreams of the victims that have seen the original picture until their final days. After the failed interview with Mary, I decided to keep researching, but everything led me to a dead end street. A year after, I received an email from Mary that got me totally by surprise. I'm sorry about my behavior last summer. See, I've had nightmares about a smile dot dog every night for 15 years. 
I know this might sound absurd, but it is the truth. In my dream, I can't move. I can't talk. I only look in front of me and the only thing I see is that scene in the picture. I see that hand and I see that dog. He tells me something. He tells me I have to share his word, show his picture. I didn't understand it. Where was I to get it from? Soon after, I got a floppy disk in the mysterious package. I didn't need to see what was inside. I already knew. I considered my options carefully. Who should I show it to? If that smile dog dog was faithful to his word, I would sleep peacefully again. But at what price? What would the consequences be for those people that saw it? I decided not to do anything. For 15 years, I hid the floppy disk. All these years, the smile dot dog invaded my dreams. I ignored it. I ignored his request and it's been a torture. When we set up the interview, I thought about giving you the floppy disk. I didn't know you and you were so desperate to know more about the smile dot dog. But I saw you arrive through the window and I couldn't. I locked myself up in my room. I don't want anyone to suffer as I'm suffering. Please, stop your research before it's too late. Sincerely, Mary. Mary died not long after I received that email. I talked to Terence, her husband, and he told me he had burned the floppy disk. He said that while it was melting, it sounded as if it was growling, as an animal. I have to admit, I wasn't very sure how to react to all this. In the beginning, I thought it could be a practical joke, but just in case, I decided to stop my research. Soon after, I received another email. Hi, I found your emails in forums about a smile dog. I saw it and it's not as bad as people say. Here's a copy, spread the word. I was paralyzed. I felt I was going to pass out. The email came with a document attached, of course, named smile.jpg. I thought about downloading it. It was probably a fake picture. And even if it was true, how was it even possible that a simple picture could cause a curse? I really wanted to see it. I'd been searching for it for so long. If I saw it, I would know how to get rid of the dog. I thought that if I made a video about a smile dot dog, I could use the picture as evidence. Anybody who saw the video could see the forbidden picture. But... Assuming the picture is authentic, was I really gonna risk all those lives only to save myself? Could I do such a thing? Yes, I could. <coughs> to experience true terror, we not only have to resort the movies, series, or invented stories. Reality often surpasses fiction. We know that you all shattered when you heard the story of Piedad, the poisoning girl. A real case, which happened in Spain several years ago. Remember it again with us. Welcome once again, Tic Tackers. Today we will tell you a story as creepy as it is real. A case that happened more than 50 years ago, and in which four children from the same family lost their lives. It was the year 1965, and in the city of Murcia, in the southeast of Spain, this large family of 12 members lived in the basement of a building. Andres, a 37-year-old bricklayer, worked in construction with his eldest son, Jose Antonio, 16. The mother, Antonia, was 36 and pregnant with her 11th child, and also she worked outside the home. The second son was Manuel, 14, who was employed as a sheet metal worker, and the third, Piedad, the eldest daughter, who at only 12 years old was in charge of housework and taking care of her younger siblings. Also in her free time, she polished motorcycle parts, helped by Jesus, 10 years old, Cristina, 8, and Manuela, 6. The remaining four children, the youngest, were the tragic victims of this story. On December 4, 1965, the youngest of the family, Mari Carmen, 9 months old, died. She was diagnosed with death from meningitis, something common at the time. Five days later, the second of the brothers in ascending order, Mariano, two years old, died. Again, this disease was cited as the cause of death. But when the next one, Fu and Santa, four years old, died five days later, suspicion arose and the doctor went to court to sound the alarm. The deceased had unexpectedly begun to show red and then purple spots, followed by fever, blackouts, and severe convulsions. Shortly after they died, 
neighbors became concerned that the family might have a deadly contagious disease. They began to avoid them and all the children in the block received preventative medical treatment. The entire family was finally admitted to the provincial hospital of Mercia and subjected to various tests, but nothing abnormal was found. They were released to spend Christmas at home, but on January 4th, the fourth brother Andres, five years old, died. The bodies of the deceased were sent to the National Health Institute in Madrid, but the analysis didn't detect the presence of any virus. They were sent to the Forensic Anatomical Institute, and this time there was no doubt about the diagnosis. They were poisoned. Traces of chloride and cyanide were found. Two poisons that even used separately would have caused a quick death. The little ones died in less than half an hour. The results corresponded to the finding in the family home of substances, such as DDT and potassium cyanide, in two everyday products, a rat poison, and the pills that Piedad used to polish metals. The first suspects were logically the parents. Andres, along with his children, was held in the psychiatric hospital of El Palmar, while Antonia and her daughters were confined in the provincial asylum. Journalists from the main newspapers, who smelled big news, began to arrive to try to interview the protagonists, using any maneuver, even giving toys to children. Manuela, with six years old, told reporters, you take pictures of me because you know I'm going to be the next to die. Since I'm now the youngest, I have to die the first. Beside her, her older sister Piedad was impassive. The media defined her as strange, ironic, playful, with lively eyes and a graceful walk, with a sly and scary smile. She had been the last to see her brothers alive before they died. She explained it easily, as if it were not so important. She remembered how Fu and Santa called her moments before she died. Piedad, come quickly, I'm dying. The police began to suspect her since she was in charge of taking care of the little ones, and she fed them when the parents were not there. One of the brigade inspectors set her up. He invited her out for a drink at a bar and started playing with her. He showed her one of the potassium chloride tablets, and the girl recognized it as the one she used to clean motorcycle parts. Joking, the inspector pretended to drop the pill into the girl's glass of milk, and she, laughing at first, but then angry, stopped him. Don't do that. You can do a lot of damage to someone. The investigator took the opportunity to ask her about the death of her brothers, and the girl ended up confessing everything. I killed the four, the first three by order of my mother, the last one I killed by myself, by my own impulse. She explained how she prepared the poison, making balls with the metal cleaning tablets and the rat poison, which she then poured into her brother's glasses of milk. She was admitted to a psychiatric hospital, and she came to give up to five different versions of the events, which contradicted each other. Her responses were quick, trying to appear as if there was no deception in them. Investigators concluded that she was solely responsible, ruling out the mother's involvement. She was overwhelmed by having to spend the day taking care of her siblings. She began to poison the little ones because they were the ones that occupied her the most. She wanted to get rid of everyone and have time to go out and play with her friends. Psychologists considered her an apparently normal girl, totally responsible for her actions, but suffering from psychopathy and acting with malice and premeditation. Her admission to prison was decreed, but as she was a minor, she could not be prosecuted. She was placed in the custody of the juvenile court, and after she entered the convent of the Obladas, where the nuns cared for girls who had gone astray or were at risk. She was sweet, cheerful, and eager to finally be a girl and enjoy playing. She liked to knit, and her dream was to go live with her aunt, who had no children. Some people say that in time, she also became a nun. Others say that she ended up leaving the convent to start a new life. The truth is that she was never heard from again. Today, she could be any ordinary 66-year-old lady, with the same bright eyes and sly smile, hiding a dark criminal past. Returning to the data that we tell you about us, where we live, the Halloween party is better known as Samain. Do you want to know more about this celebration? Then don't miss the following video. Hey there, TikTokers! Today we tell you a strange curiosities of the most terrifying night of the year. Halloween is one of the most famous American events, but it was not where it was born, but we find its origin in Ireland and the Celts. The Celts believe that the year was divided into two parts, one light, summer, and one dark, winter. What we now know as Halloween was their sowing, the end of the cycle of light and harvest, and marked its end of the year. 
Just on that night, the one that passed from October 31st to November 1st, they believed that the dead could visit the world of the living. To ward off evil spirits, the Celts dressed in animal heads and skins while their priests performed fire rituals. The tradition of dressing up had the mission of camouflaging among the dead to avoid being attacked. What you may not have known is that Halloween was for many the perfect occasion to find their soulmate. Yes, yes, TikTokers. In some areas of Ireland, Halloween was celebrated with games that supposedly predicted what your future partner would look like. In one of these customs, single women walked that night hand in hand, two by two, and pulled the first cabbage they found. That cabbage, big, small, straight, or misshapen, would be a reflection of what her future partner would be like. Handsome, ugly, tall, or stooped. And not only that, if the root had a little soil, the boyfriend would be rich. If his stem was smooth and soft, he would have a good character. But if the stem was rough, there would be many fights in the relationship. And if a woman didn't have another single friend to look for her cabbage, she would also stand in front of the mirror on Halloween night, with her eyes closed, and eat an apple. When she opened her eyes, she would see her soulmate in the reflection. Apples were also associated with Ireland's Halloween. After dinner, the young people would drop the skin of this fruit to the ground, believing that it would show the initial letter of their future partner. And for those who already had their better half, they could see the future of the two. They only had to burn two nuts together in the fire. If they burned close together, the couple would be happy, and if the nuts separated in a sparked fire, the couple would be in a lot of trouble. One of the curiosities that we like least is the one that has to do with the fact that some US animal protection organizations don't allow the adoption of black cats on dates close to Halloween. Several have had to take this measure for fear that these animals will be mistreated by superstitions because they are related to bad luck and witches. And before we go, one last curiosity. Is Halloween fattening? No, we get fat. And it is estimated that in the US, people can consume about 7,000 calories per person in sweets. And not just sweets, because Halloween also leaves us with typical sweets such as caramelized apples in the US, bonfire toffee in the UK, barn brack in Ireland, pan de muerto in Mexico, and huesos de santo in Spain. Did you know these curiosities about Halloween? If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it. And if you want to see more Draw My Life videos, subscribe to our channel. See you in the next episode. Where we live, it is very typical for students to take a decorated pumpkin to school a week before Halloween and create a terrifying display with them all. The designs are supposed to be scary, but lately we can also find adorable and funny creations. Do you do it too? We're going to leave you with the explanation of this pumpkin custom and we will also give you an idea to make your own in the tic-tac draw style. The term Halloween comes from the English expression All Hallows Eve and its origin is linked to the Celtic commemoration of Samhain and the Christian festivity of All Saints. The concept of Halloween has evolved a lot throughout history. Traditions have been changing and new elements have appeared along the way. When we think of Halloween, our head fills up with horror symbols and characters. One of the most famous are carved pumpkins. We're going to be talking about this today. This video will have two parts. In the first one, we will tell you all the story behind Halloween pumpkins. And in the second one, we will make a tutorial of how to carve one with Tick and Tack's faces. Our mascots, that's their name. Yup, you've heard right, we're going to the DIY. Even though it seems difficult to believe, originally Halloween pumpkins were not pumpkins. All around Ireland and the UK, where this custom comes from, there was this old tradition of carving lanterns with vegetables, mainly turnip and beetroot. There is an old Irish folklore tale that tells the story of Stingy Jack, 
a mean but clever farmer who, with the help of a cross, used his cunning to deceive the devil and capture him. There are several versions of why he tricked him or how he did it, but they all have something in common. When Jack died, he couldn't go neither to heaven nor hell. Jack remained wandering in the eternal darkness, lighting his way with an ember from hell he had put into an empty turnip to create his lantern. Jack o' Lantern is the name of these carved pumpkins in honor to the farmer. In the British Islands, people started creating their own versions of the Jack o' Lanterns, carving gloomy faces in vegetables, which were later placed over graves to light the way back to the world of the living for their loved ones who had passed away during the night of October 31st. They also placed them in their houses to protect them from stingy Jack and the bad spirits. When Irish people went to the US, they realized turnips and beetroots weren't as abundant as in their country, but there were lots of pumpkins, which turned out to be perfect to create lanterns. And so the tradition started changing, and carved pumpkins with the face of jack-o'-lantern started becoming very popular all around the US, and from there to the entire world. And now, let's start with our tutorial on how to carve tick and tack pumpkins. Are you ready? It's the first time we do something like this, so we don't really know what we're doing. We hope you understand. The first thing to do when making a tutorial is listing the materials. So, let's go for it! In materials. Obviously, we will need a pumpkin. Well, actually two, one for tick and one for tack. We will also use tools to carve. We have got this pumpkin set, but you can also manage with whatever you have at home. When we're doing crafts, it's always important to have scissors and, of course, duct tape. Since we don't really know what the result of this carving set will be like, we have also got a knife and, of course, a marker to mark with. And last but not least, the templates of tick and tack spaces. You can go to the link in the description box to get them. And that's all for materials. Now, finally, let's go for it! Here is the pumpkin. The first thing we're gonna do is this mark and tick and tack spaces to shape them later on. There are two ways of doing this. One is cutting the template and sticking it to the pumpkin with the duct tape. Once the template is fixed, we start making the shapes with a punch. This pumpkin is quite soft and doing it was pretty easy. This is what it looks like with all the little holes. We can already see tick perfectly. If you feel confident enough drawing, instead of fixing the template, you can draw the face yourself in the pumpkin. Any marker will do. We're gonna use this one made of liquid chalk. Just in case we mess up, we can easily erase it. This is what tag would look like. Pretty cool, huh? We already have our tick and tag ready to be emptied. Let's open the pumpkin from the top as if making a cover. We will use this little sauce we have in the set and a knife to help. Surprise, surprise! They got better than we'd expected. So great, we've got it. There are lots of seeds, we'll eat them later. Now, time to empty, empty and keep emptying. It is a lot better if you have a metal spoon, easier. We don't have one. It is a bit tiresome, but we hope the result is worth it. Very, very important. If you're young, all tasks that imply using sharp tools, always do them with an adult. We don't want anybody getting hurt. And tax pumpkin would be done. We have emptied ticks without recording it, but following the same process. Now, let's cut the shades with this sewing thingy that's working really well. It's not too hard, see? Since it's made of liquid chalk, we can erase it very easily. The mouth, the eyes, and last, the eyebrows. And it's done! Now, it's turn for tick. Same process again, taking all the parts out eyes, the chubby cheeks, done! Looks pretty adorable! We already have both pumpkins carved, emptied and with their respective covers. Now, time for the final step! To do this, we can use candles or a LED lamp. We are using candles, being very careful and with the help of an adult. We put the candles inside the pumpkins and light them. Lights off! And wow, they look great! Look how cool! Hopefully, you'll make them as well at home. And we are approaching the end of this Halloween night special, TikTokers. We would like to thank you once again for your support day after day accompanying us. 
We want to know how many of you have reached this part of the video to know how many TikTokers we have on the channel. We know there are many of you. To do this, we will play a little joke on other users. We want all of you who are watching this to write a comment saying, We finally meet the faces of TikTok Draw! Those who haven't watched the video will not know what you're talking about, but we will see you and we will send you a big heart for getting here. Among all your comments, we will choose several to greet you in the following video. So stay tuned! A big hug, guys! We say goodbye with the last video! It was Martha's brother's birthday and they had prepared a surprise party for him. His friends, uncles and other family had already arrived and were hiding. When her brother arrived home, everyone shouted, surprise! However, something had happened to the young man because he had a sad expression. Everyone continued with the party and Martha noticed the absence of her little sister, so she decided to go upstairs. As she passed through the hall, her cousin came out of one of the rooms and asked her if she wanted to play the smile game. Martha didn't know it, but she accepted because she felt like entertaining herself with someone. Her cousin jumped up and ushered her into the room where she also found her sister. She hugged her and the cousin told them out loud, To start playing, you have to blindfold yourself and do what the host does, which in this case is me, because I have invited you to play with me. Martha didn't like the idea of blindfolding her, so she didn't cover them completely, leaving the lower part slightly raised to be able to see a little. In this way, she was able to observe that the boy, when the three were blindfolded, had removed the cloth from his eyes and was looking for something under the bed. Martha pretended not to see anything, asked him what he was doing, but the young man all laughed in the car away. Suddenly, he took out a very sharp knife. Then Martha quickly took off the blindfold and ordered him to hand it over to her. When she wanted to take it from his hands, the boy pushed her hard. His face looked like that of a psychopath and without stopping laughing and staring at her, he began to cut his mouth at the corners, drawing a long smile of blood. The young man slowly approached the little girl, offering her the knife to do the same. But Martha kicked him, preventing him from approaching her sister. The young man got up from the ground quickly and they began to fight. He insisted that they should continue with the game because she had agreed. In the middle of the struggle, the young man stuck the knife in Martha's back. She could only yell at her sister to run away and call her parents. As blood dripped from her back, her cousin crouched down and stared at her as he whispered, This little face is missing a smile. And suddenly, everything went black. Martha woke up in the hospital surrounded by her parents and older brother. She tried to speak, but she couldn't. She had a bandage that covered the entire lower part of her face. The doctor came in and removed the bandage, told everyone that the image could shock them, and he still didn't know for sure how the wounds would heal. When the cloth was removed, Martha's parents and brother were shocked. They gave the young woman a mirror and she could only scream and cry. She had the same smile as her psycho cousin. Martha told her parents that everything had been the young man's fault. They looked at each other and told her that her cousin wasn't at the party. They wanted to tell her at the end of the celebration. Her uncles and cousin had an accident on the road and the aunt was the only survivor. Her older brother had just heard the news when he came home and discovered the surprise party, which is why he was so sad and withdrawn. Weeks later, Martha's aunt went to visit her and brought her a book called The Smile Game. The young woman knew that this fact couldn't be a coincidence and quickly read the first page. There, it was explained that the game was a ritual that kept the spirits in the earthly world. The spirit tricked humans by posing as another mortal and inciting them to play. Then, he cut their mouths, drawing them a big smile. In this way, he cursed them and took away their souls so that he could continue wandering through their world. At the end of the book, there were photos of several people with the same smile that she had. Martha never stopped dreaming about the game and her cousin. She could never again look at herself in a mirror and see the result of the smile game.
If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it. And if you want to see more Draw My Life videos, subscribe to our channel. See you in the next episode.